Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Gaming to the Com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with Matisse, more accurately, a 16-core engineering sample processor that has been discovered as part of the Ryzen 3000 series family. This discovery was made by Term Apisac, and I want to stress it is an engineering sample CPU, but I'll get into what that means in more in just a moment. But let's have a look at the clock frequencies. So the base frequency is being listed as 3.3 GHz with a boost clock of 4.2 GHz, and it is running on an X570 motherboard. So it is an engineering sample CPU, so therefore this does not necessarily mean that the 16-core processor is going to be running at those frequencies. In fact, we have several different possibilities here. The first possibility is that, yes, the processor is going to be roughly at around 4.2 GHz for the 16-core parts from AMD. Personally, I think that's a little low. I think that uh, it's very unlikely that we're going to see the 16-core CPUs from AMD uh, reach only at 4.2 gigahertz. Another possibility is it is just simply because it's an engineering sample processor. Unfortunately, we don't know how late of a revision yet the engineering sample is. Is it very close to a qualification sample? Qualification samples are basically like, hey, this is pretty much, we're certain, as close to retail as we can get. There's no bugs, there's no issues, everything's running at pretty much the final frequencies we're not getting any errors with the logic you know the cache isn't exploding we're not getting you know weird problems at all and it seems to be compatible with all the motherboards that type of thing so this is not a qualification sample it is an engineering sample cpu another possibility is that AMD themselves are sandbagging and releasing a processor that is not quite at the frequencies that they know they can hit why would they do that? Well, it may be that they're deliberately leaking this result simply to downplay expectations before we see an official reveal of their lineup of processors. In fact, uh, there is another example of an engineering uh, sample CPU that we can use, and it is actually from back when AMD were first launching Ryzen. The French publication Canard PC managed to grab four CPUs which were engineering sample Ryzen 1000 series parts. Two of the samples was four core, while another two were eight core processors. And you can see uh, here from a screenshot from Guru3D the frequencies that they'd managed to uh, grab from these processors, with the highest Turbo 1 core frequency being at just 3.5 GHz, with an all core frequency of just 3.3 GHz. This is considerably less than what the Ryzen 1000 series CPUs in their retail configuration was capable of. In fact, we saw the 1800X with a turbo frequency of 4 GHz. So do I think that we are only going to be seeing 4.2 GHz for the 16-core Ryzen 3000 series? No, I don't think so. I think that we will see a higher clock frequency than what we're seeing from this engineering sample. Is it, though, going to hit that magical 5 gigahertz mark? Well, unfortunately, no one really knows. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw lower, clock, lower core count variants of the processors, such as, say, 12 core, having a higher clock frequency. But, obviously, we can only wait and see what AMD are going to bring to the table. Another question I've been asked a couple of times is, will the dual-channel memory uh, be a problem for the 16 core processors on the Ryzen 3000 series platform. After all, Threadripper has quad channel memory for the sake of argument. Well, I suspect that in some applications, in some benchmarks, uh, it is going to probably hold the processor back. But I also suspect that if you are running an application which really does take advantage of lots of processor cores, you're still going to be far better to have a 16-core processor than, let's say, a 12 or an 8-core processor. It would be interesting, though, to start doing uh, memory frequency and timing tests. So, for example, how does uh, running, let's say, 3000 megahertz memory uh, bottleneck the 16-core uh, CPU versus, let's say, running at 4000 megahertz, or how does, say, timings impact things? And 
in theory at least with the io die the changes in level three cash obviously we're seeing a uh, larger cash uh, there we're seeing better um overall instruction prefetch and all of the other changes that amd thus far have revealed for zen 2 i wouldn't be surprised if the cpu does handle uh lower memory bandwidth of only dual channel for the 16 core parts fairly well it would be a lot of fun though to really fresh the cpus like have several instances of different virtual machines running, have one instance of, say, 3D rendering running, another instance of, say, video encoding running, and so on, and just absolutely just go nuts with it to see what the breaking point is. While not uh, related to the news exactly, I am also wanting to ask you all a question. I'll try to remember to link a Twitter poll in the video description as well, but I do want you to leave some comments. What processor from the Ryzen 3000 series are you most interested in? From a personal standpoint, uh, as someone who does content creation, I am very curious to see what a 12 and 16 core CPU is capable of. But I suspect that if I wasn't doing YouTube or doing content creation, the CPU that I would be really just like super hyped about is the 8 or 6 core SKUs. Obviously, it's really going to depend on the pricing. I'm hoping AMD are ultra aggressive here with the price of, like, say, the 9900K. Um, they have the ability to really just swoop in and steal a lot of thunder from Intel. I mean, imagine if they release, uh, let's say, a, a CPU that's roughly clocking at the high uh, to mid 4 gigahertz mark. It's 8 core, 16 thread, and they can do so for, let's say, 150 to 200 bucks. I think those CPUs would just fly off the shelves because 8 core 16 threads is more than enough for games for the next couple of years. And the other benefit of this as well is that if you've not yet jumped onto the AMD ecosystem, then you could simply upgrade the processor later on down the line. You could plonk in a 16 core CPU if your usage scenario changes. But if you also have an older board, let's say you have, I don't know, an X370, then you do have that ability to just say, hey, I want the extra frequency and IPC of the 8-core CPU, and then once again, later on down the line, you can change your mind. So I'm going to be really interested to see what you all say, what CPU is going to be best for you. Now let's move over to Intel and Comet Lake. There's a really interesting rumor doing the rounds right now that Comet Lake will require a different motherboard slash platform, so you can't use Comet Lake on your existing Z390 setup just for the sake of argument. So Comet Lake is a 10 core 20 thread CPU, although we do not have any information yet concerning clock frequencies. So Intel's chipset driver actually does list two 400 series family chipset. The first is just 400 series chipset family and the second is 495 series chipset family. Intel appears to be trying to target at least two generations with this particular set of processors and the 495 is most likely Ice Lake S. Comet Lake S will have two, four, six, eight and ten core SKUs and it is going to be still using the 14nm process. The CPUs are scheduled for launch in the first quarter of next year, that's 2020, and we do know that the Comet Lake S family will feature higher TDPs than what we have with Coffee Lake. In theory, this means that we could see processors uh, hit over 5 GHz for the 10th generation, and this is also why we have a higher pin count as well because obviously that means it's going to consume more energy which means that they need to make sure that uh, the boards themselves are cap capable of delivering it. Part of Intel's investor relations we also have several disclosures from the company in regards to their process roadmap as well as their plans for the discrete GPUs known as XE. Ice Lake is going to ship in June and is going to offer up to twice the graphics performance compared to the older generation, two and a half to three times AI performance, twice the video encoding speed, and three times the wireless speed. Intel are planning to have several generations of 10NM, so we'll see 10NM+, 10NM, 10NM+, and finally 10NM++. Ice Lake does sport a new CPU core architecture. Lakefield hits also in 2019, but 2020 we will see Tiger Link. Tiger Lake also has a new CPU core architecture as well. 
But really interestingly, if you were to take a peek at the Generation 11 graphics engine, so if you look at Ice Lake on the left, it says new CPU core architecture. Underneath that, it reads new Generation 11 graphics engine. And then if you were to move your eyes over to Tiger Lake, it does actually mention that this will be using the new XE graphics engine. So the first product we will actually see from Intel, which will be on the 7nm node, is actually an XE GPU. And here's where things get super duper interesting to me. Because 10nm XE is going to launch for customers, for regular consumers, in 2020. To clarify what I mean here, that means that we will be able to go out to a retailer and pick up an XE-based GPU for gaming or what have you, but for the data center, Intel are not going to launch until 2021, which does make sense. After all, that's when they are going to be supplying parts for the Aurora supercomputer, if you remember. So this means that there are several different possibilities. The first is that the 7nm variant is going to have an updated architecture altogether so you can think of this as just like the move from let's say maxwell to pascal if you were to think of it in nvidia terms and it also makes some sense because remember one of the earlier leaks way before we knew any real details of intel xe is that we will see uh arctic sound and jupiter sound so possibly what's going to happen is Jupiter Sound is pretty much going to be the data center GPU with a different architecture, and then maybe a variant of that will come to us as regular consumers, or maybe Jupiter Sound is actually specifically designed around the data center. So that's one theory. Another possibility is that the underlying architecture is really similar. The difference is, is that they've basically made a few tweaks here and there to allow the GPU to perform better in the data center. So perhaps it's going to have better floating point uh, or double precision floating point performance. Perhaps it's going to be really great at tensor operations, blah, 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 blah. Things that don't necessarily lend themselves very heavily to gaming, but who knows? The other possibilities, Intel have mentioned ray tracing. So it's going to be interesting if ray tracing is for the consumer variants, which once again are going to launch next year. So the final possibility is it's going to be more of a refresh. They're just simply going to bump up the number of execution units and the architecture and maybe make a few other tweaks which make it more data-centric, such as memory. I'll get into that in just a second. But uh, the primary difference is that it's just really a process shrink and therefore Jupiter is going to be a later architecture. In other words, this is, this is going to be a variant of Generation 12, not a full Generation 13. But yes... Um, the data center GPUs will be based on GP GPU, so we will see Phobos 3D stacking, uh, so that means that we will see a single chip which will be stacked between uh, the memory, interconnects will uh, link the memory and the GPU, and so we will have a very fast high bandwidth memory capable of providing low latency and just high throughput to the GPU cores. As for 7nm itself, there will also be three phases of 7nm so we will see much like 10nm we'll see 7nm 7nm plus and finally 7nm plus plus so these will basically be enhancements with 7nm launching in 2021 7nm plus in 2022 and guess what launches in 2023 you guessed it 7nm plus plus and there will be a multitude of enhancements compared to 10nm according to intel they are saying up to twice the density compared to uh, 10nm. It will be intranode operation, uh, optimizations, excuse me, four times reduction in design rules. EUV it will be their first process to do this. And it will also sport next generation Fovros as well as EMIP packaging, which I suspect is probably going to be one of the reasons that they're going to use this for the data center. Because obviously, if you've been looking at what Intel have been doing with uh, their persistent Optane solutions and so on and so on, it really is like part of their entire suite and solutions for the data center. I will confess, much like AMD with Narve, I do heavily support Intel and their XC graphics because I just want 
great competition in the GPU market space because obviously that just benefits us as consumers, much like I cheered when AMD launched uh, the Ryzen series of CPUs and we saw 8 cores, 16 threads being the norm now in the mainstream. I just want to see what happens when three viable contenders are launching products and each one trying to outdo the other because obviously they're not just vying for our dollars for gaming but also for the data center uh, for artificial intelligence and all of the other usage scenarios that GPUs ex excel in. So it's going to be really fascinating to see how uh, the market changes over the next several years and if NVIDIA can continue to be as dominant as what they are, particularly in data center and AI and gaming as well. It's going to be really interesting, I think, over the next couple of years. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then you know what to do. You can like it and also consider subscribing to the channel. You can also find us in the social medias linked in the video description, as well as Amazon affiliate links and Patreon. Don't feel that you have to use it, but if you do decide you want to support us and maybe you want to purchase something through Amazon, if you use one of the links there, it costs you nothing extra and it does provide us a few extra pennies. But with that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.